the agenda that we have today. Um, so we're now in the introduction and framing of the webinar, uh, which will be followed by a presentation by Claudia um, on uh, the, the, the first phase of the learning trajectory um, uh, that the webinar will address. Then we will uh, have a short Q&A with Claudia uh, based upon the uh, questions you will write down in Google Doc. And then followed by uh, two presentations, uh, one from Imogen uh, and one from Pushpita going into a diagnostic tool that we've tested in Bangladesh. And we will have a joint Q&A uh, after the two uh, presentations, uh, again, based on the questions you will write down in the Google Doc. And we will end the webinar today with a broader discussion. Um, we have invited uh, representatives from each of the Empower Youth Work countries um, to write down some of their thoughts on uh, the, the needs for them to strengthen their work on social norms, um, what they have planned already, uh, and potentially how uh, the learning trajectory uh, and the diagnostic tool that we outlined today can further support in that uh, uh, and to what end. If we can go to the next slide. Um, just to state that we now have the introduction and framing, uh, and I will do that, uh, so we can go to the next one. Um, so just to frame it a bit about what we're going to address uh, today during the, during the webinar. So I said it's going to be on the learning trajectory uh, that we have ongoing uh, within the Empower Youth Work program uh, on social norms in the economy. Um, and it's a colla collaboration between uh, the Knowledge Help Women's Economic Empowerment and Agriculture, um, who is leading on uh, the learning trajectory, uh, the design and implementation. Um, the main aim of the learning trajectory uh, is to support the, the program itself, but, but also simply Oxfam in general, and even beyond to sharpen program strategies uh, and implementation. Uh, and the focus area, the current focus area of the learning trajectory is uh, social norms in the economy. Um, and the reason for this focus area is that it's currently uh, one of the main uh, learning priorities of Oxfam when it comes to women's economic empowerment. And as such, it's one of the main thematic areas that the Knowledge Hub is currently uh, working upon. And uh, looking at Empower Youth for Work specifically, uh, it's a key part of our, uh, our theory of change, uh, specifically the third pillar we have in our theory of change, detailing uh, our efforts to create a more enabling environment uh, for for youth uh, economic participation. If we go to the next slide. So the learning trajectory, the main aim of, of this trajectory is to increase our understanding around four specific points. The first one is what exactly are social norms in the economy. Uh, it can be a bit tricky, a bit vague. We know what social norms are, but specifically looking what they are in the economy, in the economic sphere, it's something else, it's something specific, and we, we aim to get more clarity on that. Then the second point is how we can diagnose them. The third point, how we can then, based on the, the, the diagnosis, how we can design strategies uh, to change them at scale. And the fourth point is how do we measure then those changes in norms over time. So simply that, that full cycle of engaging with social norms, we aim to increase our understanding when it comes to social norms in the economy. Um, the learning trajectory, it consists of two phases. The first phase uh, has ended uh, now, recently, uh, and it engaged with learning with uh, others outside of Oxfam and a, a test within uh, one of the Empower Youth Through countries, which I will uh, tell a bit more about in a bit. And then the second phase, that is still to start, uh, from September onwards. Um, and how it will exactly look like, it will be based on the, the needs within the Empower Youth Work program uh, within Oxfam. And actually we hope that uh, the, the webinar today uh, will give some nice input, the nice start of a discussion actually about how uh, concretely that, that learning trajectory uh, can take shape when it comes to the, to the second phase. And specifically, the, the end of the webinar, the discussion, the reflection from the country offices um, will be the main input uh, to that end. If we can go to the next slide. So for today, the webinar, the, the presentations, uh, it will mainly focus on phase one to uh, disseminate the main findings and the products uh, that have come out so far. Um, so phase one, um, broadly, it consisted of two things. The first one was the setup and implementation of a practitioner's learning group, a PLG, 
Um, Claudia will go into way more detail in a bit, but uh, broadly it was to, to gather uh, various actors, uh, uh, external actors, uh, and to um, work upon all the knowledge that exists uh, on social norms in the economy within these various actors, uh, and to combine our knowledge and to see how we can build upon that. And then within the frame of the PLG, um, we have tested a social norms diagnostic tool uh, in the Empower Youth Through program in Bangladesh. Um, on the one hand, the, the PLG, uh, the gathering with all those various actors, helped to provide input on the design and test of the tool. And on the other hand, the, the testing of the tool provided input into the, uh, the learning group itself. Um, uh, so one of the main tests that, that have been conducted. And as I said, so today we will uh, detail more about phase one, uh, the main findings and what have come out. And then we will end with a uh, start of a discussion on the next steps. Uh, so to hear more from country officers, what are their needs, what are the interests when it comes to social norms, and how can the second phase of the learning trajectory uh, and the diagnostic tool answer uh, to those needs and interests. If we can go to the next slide. So without further ado, we now start with first presentation from Claudia on uh, the, the first phase and specifically the, the practitioner's learning group. Um, so Claudia, please take it away. Let me unmute you, I'm sure if you can. Claudia, I think you are able to unmute yourself. Thank yeah. you very much, Ronald. Um, my name is Claudia Canepa, and um, I coordinate Oxfam's Knowledge Hub on We in Agriculture. Um, and it's great to be able to be here and, and speak with um, all of uh, country staff from Empower Youth for Work. Um, we're very happy to be collaborating with Empower Youth for Work on this important initiative. So as Ronald mentioned, the question of how to shift social norms in the economy is a key learning priority for Oxfam. About a year and a half ago, the Knowledge Hub convened Oxfam staff from across the world to help define our learning agenda for women's economic empowerment. We gathered more than 35 people from five regions, 24 countries, and eight affiliates, um, and shifting social norms was a top issue um, that people considered um, we needed to understand to significantly advance our work on WE. So um, at the same time, outside of Oxfam, more and more markets development practitioners are recognizing the need to address social norms in their work. And this has led to a lot of in interest to learn together across organizations. Um, so, um, to make you know a long story short, because social norms work is very new for Oxfam, we decided that the first phase of the learning trajectory on social norms for Empower Youth for Work would engage external practitioners, not just Oxfam staff, so that we could tap into the expertise of others. So there are various organizations, such as the SEAT Network and Beam Exchange, um, whose job is to promote learning and networking across organizations and practitioners in the markets and enterprise development sector. And they've been um, developing very innovative learning methodologies. So Oxfam approached SEEP and we established a partnership with them so that they could facilitate what they've developed as the practitioner learning group. Um, and this methodology, the main driver behind it, uh, is the recognition that practitioners, like all of you, are very busy people and you don't have time to engage in learning initiatives unless they help you directly implement and advance your work. So the PLG process brings people together who share a common challenge and leads them through um, learning that helps them um, address that challenge. And so this may involve external speakers conducting action research together or simply having the time to reflect and share insights with one another. So just uh, briefly here, we um, launched this practitioner learning group um, by 
um, announcing a call for proposals. This was done through the SEEP and BEAM network, so it consisted of more than a thousand practitioners. You know, we, we announced it among networks of more than a thousand practitioners, and we received 46 applications. And in the end, we selected 12 people to be part of this group from six organizations, which you can see on this slide. Um, from, pro from Oxfam, we have staff who represent two programs, Pushpita Saha and Imogen Davies, from, who represent the Empower Youth for Work program in Bangladesh, and Rosalind and Celia Kidder, who represent We Care program in Zimbabwe, though both of these programs are being implemented in more countries. So if you want to see the bios of these 12 members of the PLG, you can visit the URL on the screen. Um, so going to the next slide, um, you will see how the practitioner learning group consists of two, two, two components, uh, one that is focused on the six organizations and then another component that is focused on, on contributing to the wider uh, knowledge on social norms in the markets development field and learning from it. Um, and I'll explain how we're doing that in the next uh, slide. Um, within the practitioner learning group, we had um, the initial interviews with each of the members. We've had uh, three virtual meetings where we've discussed social norms, different strategies that, different, that the various organizations are addressing or using to address social norms. And we have a final call planned in September that will focus on how to measure norms over time. Um, we also applied the diagnostic tool and, um, in Bangladesh. Um, and there, there's another organization, Swiss Contact, that will be applying that in Kosovo. Um, so that's the work with regards to the practitioner learning group, but then we've also combined it with efforts to share and disseminate what we're learning. So we organized a session on social norms in the WE Global Learning Forum in Bangkok in, 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 in May, uh, where we shared some of the results of the diagnostic tool in Bangladesh. Um, and uh, as well as some work that, so that was from Oxfam and then CARE shared some work on measurement of norms. And then uh, we are also going to be disseminating the results of the PLG in future conferences and other spaces after September. So in the next slide, what are some insights that we've gained so far? Um, these are just some highlights, um, but we'll be processing them more in September um, after the final call. Um, and I'd like to be able to um, be able to have an, another discussion with you where we can um, delve deeper on them. But this is just a highlight now. We've learned that social norms, so for, first of all, you know, what are social norms? Social norms regulate what behavior is normal in a group. So they are beliefs about others' behaviors and attitudes, like what others do and approve or disapprove of. And I love this photo um, as a symbol of social norms at play in society because at times these rules that define what is normal in a group are rules of conformity, which require conformity by everyone. So for, for example, the belief that women do not work outside of the home can be quite powerful, and the sanctions involved to uphold that quite strong. So sanctions that we often see relate to women's marriage. They say, you know, women's marriage prospects are reduced if they choose to work outside of the home or women are harassed in public spaces because they're considered to be less pure if they are working outside of the home. So we're also learning about what social norms are not. So social norms are not people's actual behavior. Behavior is a product of a social norm. Um, they are also not the sum of individual attitudes and beliefs. Rather, they're what people believe others do and what people believe others approve or disapprove of. So, for example, men in a particular community may be okay with taking on the responsibility of unpaid care work in their households. These are individual attitudes. 
but they strongly you know, believe they have this misperception that others consider unpaid care work to be petty work that is beneath them and therefore they may choose not to do unpaid care work themselves. So there's an example in which this is an example in which individual attitudes differ from what people think others do or disapprove of and that has an, a, an impact on their behavior. So your intervention in that case would need to focus on addressing people's misperceptions of what they think others do or disapprove of rather than trying to um, uh, change individual attitudes themselves. Um, another insight relates to the importance shape or distort markets or influence economic behavior and, and design strategies accordingly. So if you're looking at the issue of child marriage, it's important to understand the issue from the perspective of how they affect girls and young women's participation in the economy and then design specific interventions for, for that, not uh, general interventions on reducing child marriage. So, and we can I can speak more about this in the Q&A if that's of interest. Um, another, uh, I would say that um, just uh, a, a final insight that I want to share with you is the strategies for affecting change at scale uh, we found um, involve working and coordinating at multiple levels. So going beyond just awareness raising. Uh, what we're seeing is that, um, sorry, um, yes, that, uh, sorry, one second. Yeah, so we need to adopt a system-wide integrated approach that involves, um, you know, doing, for example, community level awareness raising, through different methods, but also working with government or the private sector on wider public engagement uh, um, or um, social marketing campaigns uh, and coordinating with policymakers to create an enabling environment. So the main question that we have here is how do we do this effectively given the constraints of time and resources? How do we capitalize on working with the private sector and the media angle for change at scale to complement our work at the community level? So um, these are just a few highlights. Again, I'm happy to go into this in more detail in the Q&A. Um, if we go to the final slide, this just gives you a, a quick overview of, of the main outputs of the process. Um, we will have briefs of each organization that is participating in the PLG, so you know what kinds of norms they're working on and the types of strategies they're using to address them. And uh, also a practitioner guide on how to address social norms, um, which will include a synthesis of the PLG process. We also um, are working on a literature review, which will be finished in September. We'll have a draft this, this week. Um, which explains who's working in this area, what they're doing, and also have links to resources on, on, uh, so, on, for uh, informing our work on social norms. Then we have the tool to diagnose social norms that Empower Youth for Work has tested. And finally, a survey module that you can include in a baseline to help measure norms over time. And this is something that I believe you've already included in your baselines as part of Empower Youth for Work. So that's it for me. Thank you. Um, I'm open for questions. Over to you, Ronald. Yeah, thank you so much, Claudia, for this very nice presentation. It's not easy to, to tell it all in 10 minutes, but I think we got a very interesting uh, overview now. Um, so looking at the uh, Google Doc for the questions, um, I do not see questions yet. Um, so perhaps what we can do is uh, take uh, one to two minutes now for everyone that, that has a question to actually write it down in Google Doc. And then Claudia, I also invite you to um, uh, open Google Doc and then uh, see what comes in and then you can address these questions immediately. But for now, let's take two minutes. Um, for everyone that has a question to be able to write it down. 
And again, the link to the Google Doc is in the chat box on the right. I can't find the Google Doc link. Where, where do I get it? Okay, I see one question coming in now from Imogen. Um, I see other cursors also standing by, so there might be more questions coming in, but let's continue the conversation for now. Um, Claudia, I see that you're muted, and I might have done that by accident, so if you can uh, unmute yourself uh, again, then we can address the, yeah, there you are, the question that's come in. Um, I hope you can see the Google Doc. The link is in the chat box to your right, um, but if not, I can also repeat the question. Or do you have any uh, Yes, can you read it out loud? That'd be good. No worries. So it's from Imogen, and the question is, I'm interested to hear more about how we can shift social norms at scale. Uh, in other words, go beyond community-level work. So if you have any other... Yes, yeah, so what I was mentioning is um, this, uh, this approach, a system-wide approach that involves working and coordinating at multiple levels. So at community level, we often do awareness raising through different methods, but then we can also organize, um, work with, uh, with the government uh, to organize uh, public um, communication campaigns or work with the private sector to change, um, you know, employment practices and so forth. So it's, it's about working at different levels um, and with different kinds of uh, actors. Also, identifying role models and champions to challenge prevailing norms, um, supporting women's rights organizations and movements to drive collective action. Um, yeah, these are, and, and influencing policymakers. So, for example, Oxfam's We Care Research and Advocacy has shown that understanding existing narratives and priorities and agendas of policymakers can help you identify key entry points to engage with them. Okay. I see more questions coming in, and please keep them coming. We might not be able to engage with all of them, looking at time, uh, but we will keep the Google Doc open, and we can answer, actually, the questions also in writing it and share it. Uh, with the full group afterwards, so uh, feel free to keep them coming. Um, Claudia, our next question is from Shazad from uh, Pakistan, and it entails what kind of approaches can be employed to change norms for very young girls, age 15 to 20? Is there something we can say about that? Um, 
There is, uh, I, I, I'll just share some examples from the International Youth Foundation uh, of work that they're doing in, in Mexico. Um, they're working together with um, schools as well as parents to, cha to raise awareness about um, girls' choices in terms of, of careers and in, it, it was. It's quite interesting that girls often just uh, um, assume that they they will be they will work in the care industry or in or, or as secretaries, um, and so to raise awareness about the skills that they have and other kinds of opportunities is is important. But doing that not just with the girls but the parents and the teachers as well, and then working with employers to also change their um, conceptions or perceptions about girls' uh, skills and um, other aspects like their reliability and so forth. Okay, there are more questions coming in and let's take one last question um, and then we can um, uh, keep up answering questions offline um, after the webinar and then share with, with the group. Um, let's, let's take the one that came in. Third, um, and that is from uh, Abdul Rehman, um, and it goes, I'm not sure if you got it right, but when a community does something over a long period of time, it implicitly becomes part of culture. So I think what is referenced here is a bit the, the link between social norms and, and culture and how to deal with it. The question, what is the question? So it's more a statement. I'm not sure uh, if I got you right, but when a community does something over a long period of time, it implicitly becomes part of culture. Yes. So perhaps is there something we can say about the link between social norms and culture, or? Um, yeah, so, so what, uh, there are different fields of thought, um, and there people often make a distinction between a social norm and a custom, for example. Um, but I, I think when things are very ingrained, it's important to, to be working both on personal attitudes and as well as norms, um, like what people think others do or, or others approve or disapprove of. That's what I mean by norms. Um, in, you, you have to be working at both levels in order to change, uh, create more positive outcomes. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, no, Claudia. Uh, there are more yeah. questions coming in, um, but looking at time, um, it will become a bit difficult. So please keep the questions coming in and we can take them up in writing uh, offline. Um, but for now, uh, I want to thank Claudia so much and let's move on to uh, the next uh, uh, presentation. Um, and I, I just want to okay. say uh, th thank you very much for these questions and you know, we, this is a work in progress. We're all working on this together. Um, so I'm sure you have also some something to share on this. And I will, you know, we'll we'll bring these questions to the PLG as well and, and get back to you with some answers. But um, hopefully, in the next uh, phase of the learning trajectory, we can also focus on on these uh, questions or the questions that you identify as top for your work. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you so much, Claudia. And, and indeed, it's the, the webinar is now a start of a discussion and, and not the end, so it's, it's very good to, to reiterate that. Um, so let's move on for now to the presentations on the diagnostic tool. Uh, uh, Imogen will detail the methodology used, and Pushpita will uh, talk about the findings uh, that came out of the test in, in Bangladesh. Um, so let's go to the next slide, and then I would like to invite Imogen to uh, give the presentation. Um, unfortunately, Imogen has uh, a bit of problems with her voice. She has lost her voice a bit, so let's see how it goes. Um, and if necessary, I will uh, take over her part of the presentation if, if it seems difficult. Um, so Imogen, please start and let us know how it goes. 
Thanks, Ronald. Um, yeah, so if you're having problems hearing me, just write in the chat box and um, I will pass over to Ronald. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about um, the methodology that we developed for the diagnostic tool in Bangladesh and um, before passing over to Pushpita for the findings. Go to the next slide. So, um, as Ronald mentioned in his presentation earlier, uh, social norms are a key part of the third pillar of the Empower Youth for Work um, program theory of change, which you can see here on the screen, um, and specifically on um, supporting an enabling environment for young people um, to um, for their social and economic empowerment, and particularly the first three bullet points that you can see there um, as part of the third pillar on enabling environment. Next slide. So um, there are three areas of um, gender and economic norms um, which we identified in the Empower Youth for Work theory of change relating to young people's and um, especially young women's economic um, participation. And the first is around unpaid care work and paid and productive work. The second uh, relates to gender-based violence or GBV. Um, and the third is around sexual and reproductive health rights. And in this tool, we specifically focused um, on early marriage and early pregnancy to make sure um, that we could have, uh, an, um, that we could um, zo zone in a bit um, on one specific area of SRHR rather than having the tool um, be too broad. Um, and looking at social norms relating to gender-based violence and to sexual and reproductive health rights has been prevalent in um, development work, but looking at these social norms, particularly in relation to economic participation, is a, a less developed area. So this is something that we really wanted the tool to help with. So, um, as you know, the Empower Youth for Work program has already done a baseline survey, which I think is being finalised at the moment, um, and that measured some of these social norms. Um, so this di diagnostic tool was really a, a qualitative tool which aimed to dig deeper. Um, so we conducted um, a one-day diagnostic tool um, with a small group of 10 to 15 young people and stakeholders in rural areas of Bangladesh, and that was done twice. Um, and that was done to identify and measure social norms impacting on young people's um, and especially young women's economic participation. But we also wanted to go beyond identification and measurement to see if this tool could provide an entry point also to developing strategies um, to engage with some of the social norms in the economy which the tool identified. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about the structure of the tool. So um, the tool is split into two parts and the first activity um, acts as an introduction to social norms, um, looking at what the influences are on social norms and how social norms have changed in a specific context. And then the second activity looks at the three areas of social norms that we identified in the Empower Youth for Work theory of change that impact on young people's economic empowerment. So um, unpaid care and productive work, gender-based violence and early marriage and pregnancy. And it also looked at how those norms can be changed. So I'm now going to go into each activity in more detail um, before handing over to Pashpita. Pashpita. So um, the first part of the um, of activity one. Um, first of all, we looked at what tasks good women and good men do. And this was because we wanted to tease out the differences between social norms and personal beliefs and attitudes. And this is what um, this is what Claudia was talking about in her presentation. Um, and then we looked at exploring sayings about good women and good men. So again, going beyond individual perceptions and individual personal beliefs to social norms in the community. And this um, led to discussions about how women and men should behave. Uh, and this is, again, going back to um, what Claudia said about looking at what um, people think that um, others think they should do, um, not just looking at um, what people think others do. Uh, and we need to look at both of those areas um, in order to um, understand and to shift social norms. And then um, we also looked at economic norms as well as just um, gender norms. So we looked at um, norms relating to whether unpaid care and paid and productive work is perceived as skilled and valuable, um, as well as the way and um, the different types of work um, are divided um, between people or different types of tasks and behaviours um, are assigned to women and men um, according to the acceptability of different gender roles. Um, and it was also crucial that we asked about um, 
what communities or peers would say rather than just what individuals would say. Um, and that was about going, again, going beyond um, individual beliefs um, and, and attitudes um, to wider social norms, and um, but also to avoid um, social desirability bias whereby um, participants would just give us the answers that they think facilitators want to hear. So um, after that, we, we carried out exercises as groundwork for developing strategies for change. So first of all, um, there was an exercise on how social norms have changed in the last three to five years. And that was to show that norms can and that they do change. So they're not static and immovable. Um, they're not a completely immovable part of culture. Norms do change. Um, sometimes slowly, but um, we wanted to, to, make, um, to bring that to participants' attention. Um, and then we carried out a mapping exercise on the influences of social norms um, to explore how norms can be changed. So um, looking at, for example, um, people's peers, parents, teachers, religious or cultural leaders, um, celebrities, but then also going beyond people to things like um, laws or policies, evidence or information, um, schools, training that people might receive, uh, media. So looking at both people, but then um, also um, things like laws and policies, which can which act as influences on social norms. And then moving on to the second activity. We first looked at um, gender norms relating to unpaid care and paid and productive work, as well as um, barriers to change. So um, first participants um, explored the division of work between women and men. Um, and then participants were encouraged to think about the underlying reasons um, for those divisions and for the social norms relating to what is acceptable um, for women and men to do. Um, so for example, um, employment practices, um, institutions, education, policies and laws um, driving those social norms. Um, and then in a similar vein they looked at barriers to women doing what was perceived as men's work and um, barriers to men doing what was perceived as women's work. Um, and then we um, went beyond looking at um, unpaid care and paid and productive work um, to looking at gender-based violence and how social norms around gender-based violence relate to economic participation. Um, so we had a number of discussion questions um, and first of all we looked at how the transgression of gender norms relating to unpaid care and paid and productive work can lead to gender-based violence and intimate part partner violence. So for example, if women do their care work badly, so for example, if they burn the dinner or um, they're back late and they, um, and they don't chop firewood on time or they um, run a bath too hot, um, or that might lead to um, gender-based violence or intimate partner violence. Or if they start doing paid and productive work, which puts them in a new role and doing new things which they weren't doing before, so they're earning more money or they're going out into the public sphere, they have increased mobility, does that lead to increased gender-based violence or intimate partner violence? Um, and then secondly, we also looked um, at the um, effect um, of gender-based violence and community censure um, or the, the fear of, of, that, of that community censure or, um, or harassment or viol uh, violence on young people's economic participation. So for example, that might be whether um, the fear of um, harassment or violence limited the, um, the type of economic activity women would participate in. So um, if women, for example, knew that um, if they're in public spaces or if they're on buses or the street, um, they're going to experience like, catcalling or, or groping, or if in the workplace they're going to experience sexual harassment, um, then that might mean that they don't um, participate in that kind of work. And then similarly, um, whether a fear of mocking or humiliation stops men participating in care and domestic work. So if men um, so start, um, start washing clothes or start looking after children, if, if that's going to bring that masculinity into question, if the community will start talking about them, for example. Um, and then similarly, we had a discussion around um, gender norms on early marriage and early pregnancy and how those relate to, um, to economic participation. So um, first we discussed norms about expectations in the community to marry and have children. And then we looked at the impact of early marriage and pregnancy on young people's economic participation. 
So for example, um, how women are limited in their economic participation by marrying or having children young. But also um, how norms relating to working women being unfeminine or unmarriable. So um, if, if women go out to work, if they're seen as, as no longer desirable as a wife um, or um, women participating in work aren't feminine anymore, if that means that um, they won't do that because that um, impacts on their marriage chances and that's therefore going to um, influence the, the type of economic opportunities which they think are available to them. And then finally, participants looked at strategies for change. So um, first of all, uh, we did a ranking exercise on which um, unpaid care tasks are more feasible for men to do um, and which paid and productive tasks are more feasible for women to do to see um, where there was most scope for change. Uh, and then we asked participants how they would promote change in norms relating to unpaid care and paid and productive work, um, relating to gender-based violence and relating to early marriage and early pregnancy. And then um, finally, uh, participants brainstormed interventions based on effective influences and drivers of change. Um, so for example, community leaders, um, government policies, media, etc., cetera, um, which I mentioned before. Okay, um, so that is the end of the presentation about the methodology. Um, I think we're going to have a short break so people can write down any um, immediate questions which occur to them um, before we move on to push Peter's presentation on the finding and then we'll have a, a question and answer for both of our sessions. Thank you so much, Imogen. And indeed, like, let's take uh, a one to two minute break now to write down all the questions and then we continue. Okay, I see a lot of questions coming in, which is very nice. Um, please keep them coming, of course, and in the meanwhile, let's already start with the next presentation on the uh, findings that came out of the actual test of the tool in Bangladesh. Um, so, Pushpita, please uh, take away your presentation. Thank you, Ronald, and thank you, Emojan, and thank you, everyone, for joining this webinar today. So, moving on. One of the core findings from the diagnostic tool test is that care work is seen to be easier than men's work and not as physically demanding. Both male and female participants, uh, say, uh, uh, mo both male and female participants see men's work as more difficult and requiring more energy and skills. They also feel men's work make the largest contribution to the household community and country because it has greater visible monetary value. To explain their view, one female participant made the following statement, and I quote, my grandchildren will not starve to death if my daughter-in-law does not do the dishes for a day or two, but they will, uh, 
the, but they will if my son does not pull his visa back even for one day. Uh, next slide, please. It seems the slides are not changing at the moment, so Peter, perhaps we can simply go on and uh, let's figure out how we can, uh, perhaps there's a technical difficulty. So let, let's move on for now and figure out in the background the, the, the slides. Uh, so, uh, okay, so I'll continue with my slides. Okay. Uh, so moving on, uh, gender roles are also seen as natural. So one recurrent argument throughout the workshop was that this is how things have always happened. And this is closely tied to the communities, religious, as well as cultural beliefs. The participants believe women are instinctively more caring, inherently better at housework than men. And to support this argument, they emphasize on the psychological as well as physiological differences between the sexes. They said it is because of these differences, for example, that men make good disciplinarians while women are better as the primary carers. There is also social stigma attached to men doing care work. Uh, family and community jeer at men who do women's work. Men feel emasculated if they have to do women's work. As one male participant expressed, it is humiliating for me as a man to do all the housework, even if I can. This social stigma is enforced at both community as well as family levels. And there are complex power dynamics contributing to this, enforce, to this uh, enforcement of the social law. Moving on to the next slide. Debilitating gender norms also reinforces women's negative self-image. Women, especially young girls, take into consideration how productive work affects their ability to marry. The perception is that women who work in markets become shrewish and undesirable. This is because women have to be dominant and assertive to survive in male-dominated spheres and assertiveness in women is often viewed as coarse and unfeminine. There is also the concern that women who work late or in evenings or in male-dominated male spheres sometimes have their characters or reputation brought into question. Another common perception is that hard physical labor distorts women's bodies. Basically, all these views are associated with the commonly held belief that women should be docile, demure, soft-spoken, and above all, soft in all the right places. Women who are not expressively maternal or do not demonstrate feminine qualities through visible care work are often branded as selfish, uncaring, and unfeminine. Moving on. Fear for women's safety in workplace or on their journey to work is another barrier to women taking on productive, work outside home, especially if the workplace is quite a distance away from home. There is also particular concern regarding violence that can happen and harassments that can happen in the marketplace itself. As one male participant pointed out, men in markets swear a lot and sometimes fight, and I don't want my wife swearing or being swear at. There has been suggestions of single sex markets for women because participants feel that mixed markets, mixed markets won't ever work because women will always be under threat of violence and humiliation in, uh, in mixed markets, where there are both male and female uh, participants. Another crucial finding from the test is that gender norms both affect and is affected by decisions regarding early marriage and pregnancy. More early marriage and pregnancy affect women's ability to do hard physical work because the pregnancy as well as a marriage saps their physical strength. Moreover, early marriage equals more children and more children equals increased care work responsibilities for women. 
On the other hand, segregation of care roles linked with women's biological reproductive, biological reproductive roles, which in turn is linked with early marriage and pregnancy. Surprisingly, or not so surprisingly in this case, both women and men feel that women's primary role is that of a caregiver, and that role would be affected through mobility of any sort. To summarize in the participants' words, a wife's family, especially young children, will suffer if she works full-time outside the home at any capacity. Moving on to the next slide. So what's the silver lining here for us practitioners? Thankfully, all hope is not lost. Men doing care work is not, not completely unheard of. Men sometimes do care work before marriage or when they live alone, or when women are not at home or are undisposed or unwell. There are certain types of care work men are more comfortable doing. These are generally tasks that are not overtly considered as care work or housework. For example, food shopping, taking children to school, helping children with their homework, caring for the disabled and sick family, uh, family members in terms of taking them to the toilets or to the doctors and similar tasks. One interesting observation that we noted here during the workshop is that participants' attitude towards physical and mental differences between sexes contributing to traditional gender roles underwent a visible change from the beginning towards the end of the workshop. Towards the end, participants were more willing to accept that women and men are capable of doing each other's work, especially after examples of successful female entrepreneurs and farmers were given. We used role models from their own society and own community to drive the message that women can too be entrepreneurs and still be feminine and uh, soft-spoken. However, although they appreciated that uh, this can ha happen, this appreciation did not necessarily translate into accepting overlapping gender roles. The view was that capacity to do each other's work does not necessarily mean they should actually do each other's work. This attitude is more deeply ingrained and less easy to show. It is safe to infer here that the arguments surrounding the physical and psychological differences between the sexes are mostly formed to validate this primary attitude. Moving to the next slide. Another argument that the participants uh, put forward that reinforces their previously held attitude, the more, more deeply ingrained attitude, is the well-developed self-perpetuating logic, which, is, which goes like men work mostly outside, so it's not possible for them to do housework. And on the other hand, women have work responsibility so they don't have care work responsibilities, so they don't have time for other kind of productive work. So as such, any interventions designed to address gender norms would have to target this attitude, this ingrained belief that uh, roles, even if, uh, gender roles, even if they are uh, transferable, should not be transferred because uh, that is not acceptable. Any Kind of intervention designed to address gender norms should also explore new positive identities for women and men that focuses on what it means to be a real man and a real woman. Basically it's about uh, the self-image that if some men do some kind of work it's uh, not manly and if women does some kind of work it's not feminine. So these issues needs to be addressed. It will also be necessary to focus on economic norms as well as gender norms men are unlikely to take on work which is perceived as easy, unskilled, and inferior. And women's work as such would also have to be rebranded as real work. Another barrier of hope for us practitioners is that norms are more rigidly upheld by community elders. Both young men and women appeared more open and flex flexible to changes in traditional gender roles as long as the changes are safe for both the parties concerned. Moving on. Finally, in this table, we have summarized what participants felt should be the core areas of interventions. One thing to note here is that these core areas are neither exhaustive nor mutually exclusive. It was opined that all these changes will reinforce each 
each other when there are dot interaction. So we asked what needs to be changed first. And according to the participants, it is the family's mindset that needs to be changed first. And it is the individual within the families who can bring about this change. So their uh, suggestion was instead of only girls, both boys and girls should be taught care work and housework from a, from a very early age. Example of successful alternative family models can also help in this regard. And they felt that in this case, elders, family elders, may act as blockers due to the complex power dynamics that exist within families. Closely linked and equally important is the change in the mindset of the society as a whole. Participants agreed it cannot be achieved by any one group. The change in societal mindset is huge and cannot be uh, achieved by any one sector working alone. According to them, educated elites, civil society, government, and non-government institutions all have a role to play here. There needs to be greater awareness regarding women's care or housework clothes and their value in economic terms. Local power holders may be opposed to this change and can act as blockers. In case of Bangladesh, the country's education system would also have to undergo a structural adjustment if any lasting change is to be achieved regarding social norms. For example, in Bangladesh, home economics course is only offered to girl students, while shop class and mechanics class is only offered to male students. There are many such instances like this in our education system. These embedded, less visible norms need to be changed as well. All sectors, including the media, would have to work together to bring this change about. The curriculum should reflect that both girls and boys can and should do unpaid care and paid productive work. It was feared that it is the religious leaders who will try to block this change for obvious reasons that we know and understand. Both women and men need to be freed from their uh, superstitions that they uh, believe in. One way to go about this would be to stop the humiliation of men who voluntarily take on care work responsibilities. Finally, of course, governments would have to change public laws and policies in order to reduce gender-based gender -based violence in public places, especially on the roads and at workplaces. It should set up more affordable and accessible care centers for children, elderly, and disabled, so as to reduce women, both men and women's care work burden. And last but not the least, it was it the participants really emphasize that the government really will have to crack down on early and forced marriages if we want to have uh, visible changes in social norms regarding gender roles. That was from my side. Thank you. And uh, Imogen and I will take your questions now. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much, Pushpita, for this very interesting presentation. And thank you to Imogen for your presentation. Um, indeed, we move into the questions section. Um, I see that already Imogen is entering in writing the questions, which is very good because actually we're running a bit short of time. Um, so perhaps what we can do um, is that we now take one to two minutes for everyone to ask uh, the questions to Pushpita that you might have uh, for Pushpita to answer and perhaps Imogen we can continue uh, from your side to have it in writing uh, but if you want to address something uh, verbally of course let me know um, but for now perhaps let's first take one to two minutes to have the questions to Pushpita also come in.
Okay, I see questions coming in for uh, Pushpita. Um, Imogen, I see that many of your questions already have been answered. I think most of them, almost all. Um, so perhaps what we can do now is uh, push Peter uh, for you to take the questions that come in in uh, your section of the Google Doc. And then if time allows, we can see if Imogen can perhaps add something to her questions when necessary. Um, push Peter, do you have the Google Doc in front of you? Uh, yes, actually. So, do you want me to write the replies, or shall I uh, explain it? Um, perhaps we can uh, take a bit of time to uh, explain it now, and then let's see how far we get, and otherwise we continue, can continue in, in writing. All right. So, the first question is from Claudia, and she's asking that there are many social norms that play in a specific context where we work. Have you identified which are the top one or two norms to focus on to effectively empower young girls targeted by our, our program? If so, how? So yes, Claudia, we have identified uh, the social norms related to economic work, such as uh, the ones uh, affecting women's productive work as one of the top norms that we want to target. Because in our baseline findings as well, we have found that uh, the fear of uh, violence at workplace and uh, on the road to and from work or at uh, training centers where women might be, um, women might have to decide to take trainings or skill trainings is one of the family reasons why women do not want to take a paid or productive work or why their family members do not want to uh, uh, engage them in paid or uh, productive work. So this is one of the crucial norms that we'll be working on to make uh, the workplace as well as the community more safe for women in terms of gender-based violence. Uh, there's another question uh, on, in answer to your question, if, uh, if so, how? We have tried to link it with our baseline findings. And Anam's question is that which interventions will the program be taking up and prioritizing and how? And as I think uh, my reply to Claudia answers that. Uh, Claudia's second question is, are there ways in which you can change the practice of harassment of women in public spaces that are beyond government policies? For example, how do you create a norm that shuns harassment of women? So in this case, I think we'll be focusing on our youths and the youth groups and how they can be mobilized to, you know, uh, so we are uh, to uh, particularly make if teasing a sexual harassment very much a no no thing to do. Uh, we'll be probably concentrating on youth becoming the protectors, especially the females through their clubs and through their groups becoming the defenders and protectors of uh, the community space, the public space that will go beyond just uh, the policy, the uh, police taking uh, an action or the policies being implemented. But these are some ideas that are still very much in our uh, you know, thinking phase and we are trying to come up with solutions that are more concrete and backed by more solid evidence. And we are trying to come up with a design for more model communities as well as villages where women will be, women groups, uh, young women groups will be trained and, you know, uh, capacitated to work as the, we tend to, we will want to uh, encourage the use of the word protectors in their own communities. Sahil, was that intentional to have this diagnostic exercise with elderly men and women? We can get different perception from young boys and girls in terms of restricting and enabling norms. Um, uh, Sahir, thank you for your question, and if it wasn't clear from my findings or from the methodology discussion, our participant group was mixed. We had both elderly men and women as well as young men and, wo men and women, which is why we got the uh, balanced view of how elderly men and women are more rigid in their uh, uh, norms. norms and uh, in the understanding of the norms uh, in the be beliefs surrounding the norms while young women and men are more open and flexible. So I'm uh, uh, asked a question that I think civil society can play a role in multiple domains like advocacy with governments. Why look limited with the awareness raising? Uh, Sama, as we, as I mentioned uh, during the presentation, the stakeholders are not uh, exclusive mutually exclusive, not other changes. 
So uh, everything, uh, when the participants expressed their points and when we did this exercise, everyone mentioned everyone because no one change could be achieved by any one stakeholder alone. But in uh, most of the changes, we tried to, uh, for this table, we tried to identify who could be the most important stakeholder. And we, after, we understand that the civil society has a role to play in all the changes that we mentioned in our table. So does the other stakeholders. But it was for clarity's sake that we tried to under, uh, identify the most important one for each change that we mentioned. So, Pusha's uh, question is, under what needs to be, under what, right. Hi, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Um, looking at time, um, we're running a bit short, looking at the last section of the webinar that we still need to do. Um, so, what I would like to propose is that the rest of the questions, we uh, also address them in writing after the webinar. Um, because they are still coming in and there's a few questions left so I think we've sparked some great interest with the tools so that is very nice unfortunately we can't address it all in the webinar so let's um, take up the remaining questions in writing afterwards and just to also uh, refer again to the questions also Imogen um, she is already answering them in writing so if you ask a question uh, please find her answers uh, already in Google Doc uh, currently um, so